It's tempting to say that the distinguishing factor between science and other modes of inquiry is that science takes nothing for granted. However, this really isn't true, as it is necessary to accept at least one proposition before scientific investigation can occur, and that is, the world is publicly understandable. Now this proposition entails at least three things. First of all, the world has a determinate structure. Secondly, we can know this structure. And third, this knowledge is available to everyone. Scientific understanding is public because it is based on information that is, in principle, available to everyone. Anyone who is willing to make the appropriate observation can see for themselves whether any particular claim is true. For instance, if someone had the appropriate tools, he or she could actually determine the speed of light. The scientific method is the most powerful method ever invented by humans for acquiring knowledge about nature. It is usually described as a four-step process. Observe. Induce a general hypothesis to explain the observations. Deduce specific implications from the hypothesis. And test the hypothesis by checking out the deduced implications. This view of the scientific method can give a misleading picture of scientific inquiry, as inquiry can occur only after a hypothesis has been formulated, and induction is not the only way to formulate a hypothesis. Hypotheses are created as open-ended processes not bound by rules of inductive reasoning. Creativity and intuition play an important role. Scientists attempt to eliminate reasonable grounds for doubting a hypothesis by testing its credibility. If predicted results occur, we have reasons to believe the hypothesis in question is true. If not, we have reason to believe it's false. Some hypotheses can be tested by means of controlled experiments. However, this isn't always possible. Take, for example, geology. The origin of Devil's Tower cannot be discovered using this approach. So, scientific methods cannot be identified with the so-called experimental method. In fact, the scientific method can't be identified with any particular procedure because there are many different ways to assess the credibility of a hypothesis. Any procedure that serves to systematically eliminate reasonable grounds for doubt can be considered scientific. The results of scientific inquiry are never final and conclusive, but are always provisional and open. Confirming evidence removes grounds for reasonable doubt, although never eliminating them completely. Additionally, Confuting or falsifying evidence is also not logically decisive. The reason is found in the quine duhem thesis. The quine duhem thesis indicates that it is impossible to test a scientific hypothesis in isolation. This is because an empirical test of the hypothesis requires one or more background assumptions, also known as auxiliary hypotheses. The hypothesis by itself is unable to make predictions. This is because the predictions are affected by background assumptions used. This prevents a hypothesis from being completely falsified if the background assumptions aren't proven. A hypothesis that is threatened by recalcitrant data can often be saved by postulating entities or properties that account for the data. Let's take the following example. If our hypothesis is that the Earth is flat, we might have an auxiliary hypothesis that light travels in straight lines. Our prediction from this hypothesis and auxiliary hypothesis is that all parts of a ship traveling away from a viewer will disappear at the same rate. When this prediction shows to be false, the hypothesis can be saved by simply modifying the auxiliary hypothesis to light travels in curved lines. 
Karl Popper claimed that what distinguished a scientific hypothesis from pseudoscience is that the former is falsifiable. Although this was good insight, it has two problems. First of all, as we discussed before, no hypothesis is strictly falsifiable, as it's possible to salvage a hypothesis by making changes to the auxiliary assumptions. And second, it doesn't explain why we hold on to some hypotheses in the face of adverse evidence. Recognizing that other criteria play a role in evaluating a hypothesis helps us make sense of this. We should understand that the evidence alone does not determine which hypothesis or theory is most rational to choose. In their book, How to Think About Weird Things, Critical Thinking for a New Age, Schick and Vaughn provide a criteria of adequacy for comparatively evaluating hypotheses to find the best explanation. Best explanation is the hypothesis that does more to increase our understanding. The criteria do not provide an algorithm or formula for determining the relative superiority of a hypothesis. Nevertheless, they can provide objective, rational guidance for hypothesis choice. There are five parts to the criteria of adequacy. First of all, testability. A hypothesis is scientific only if it is testable, and it must predict something other than what it was introduced to explain. In order to be testable, the hypothesis must have a non-circular utility in prediction. For example, if I explain the recent gray and gloomy weather by saying it was due to top-secret weather experimentation by the CIA, my explanation could not be used to make future predictions of similar weather. In other words, when will it be gray and gloomy again? When the CIA experiment makes it so. If a hypothesis is only predictive in hindsight, but not predictive in foresight, it is not testable. The second criteria of adequacy is fruitfulness. Good hypotheses explain more than they were introduced to explain. In other words, they predict unknown phenomena. Hypotheses that make accurate, unexpected predictions are more likely to be true than hypotheses that don't. For example, general relativity predicted that light rays traveling near massive objects will bend because the space around them is curved. This was a daring prediction, and one which gave credence to the theory. The third criteria of adequacy is scope. The amount of diverse phenomena explained or predicted by a hypothesis is an important measure of its merit. The more a hypothesis explains and predicts, the more it unifies and systematizes our knowledge, and the more evidence it has in its favor, the less likely it is to be false. For example, general relativity is preferred over Newton's laws of motion and gravity because it explains everything that Newton's can and more. General relativity is able to account for the precession of Mercury's perihelion, something that Newton's laws could not do. The fourth criteria of adequacy is simplicity. We shouldn't introduce unneeded explanations or cause if we already have enough to explain the phenomenon. The simpler of two hypotheses is the one that involves the fewest assumptions. For example, let's compare Copernicus's theory of the solar system with Ptolemy's. In terms of scope and fruitfulness, Copernicus's theory had no advantage over Ptolemy's. Additionally, it actually had a disadvantage in that it was inconsistent with observed data. However, Copernicus's theory was much simpler. The fifth criteria of adequacy is conservatism. In other words, the one that fits best with well-established beliefs. The chances of a new hypothesis being true are not good if it conflicts with well-established theories. For example, the U.S. Patent Office refuses to grant patents for perpetual motion machines because they violate the laws of thermodynamics.